Before we begin this week's episode, I'd like to start with a content warning. This podcast includes foul language and includes discussions of violent crimes. Some topics may be triggering and may include depictions of sexual assault, gore, torture, suicidal ideation, or discussions of mental health. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hey everyone! This is your lovely host, Courtney, from A Nefarious Nightmare. And I am also your lovely host, Amanda, from A Nefarious Nightmare. And today, we're doing something a little bit different. Courtney will be revisiting the Jason Vukovich case that we did on our pilot episode. There have been a few updates since recording that, as well as some corrections that were long due long overdue unfortunately and unfortunately amanda will not be present for this case because she's gonna be out of town and will not be back in time to record i know i'm so sorry but i have faith that you're gonna kill it the original episode was great as is but it's good you'll have the opportunity to rehash it and do it some justice anyway amanda will you do us the honor of introducing this episode yes it is called Our Alaskan Angel, Revisiting Jason Vukovich. Hello world, and welcome to my flying solo episode. I'm Courtney Fenner. You all know me by now, hopefully. And it's a little weird for me because I normally am doing this with Amanda, and I hope she's listening to this because I miss her. I miss you, Amanda. But she's out on vacation, rightfully so. She's really living it up right now, and I am going to provide you with a pretty good update on Jason Vukovich. But before I start, I want to give a shout out to Greg from Indie Drop-In as well as IndieDropIn.com. With Indie Drop-In, you get to discover a new true crime creator every week. You'll get to hear all different styles of true crime by a diverse set of creators. Maybe you want to hear about cold cases or serial killers, crimes in your hometown, crimes against a specific population, um, unsolved or even missing persons cases. You can even get a flavor of the wide range true crime content has to offer. Visit IndieDropIn.com and see what that's all about. And also, keep your ears open for a promo from Indie Drop-In later in this episode. ...and callings at different times. Um, and so, um, for me, I'm just a simple person and I, you know, look forward in my life to simple things. But I will tell you, there's very little in this life that has brought me greater pleasure or greater satisfaction than being there uh, for someone else um, in right. a way that no one was there for me when I was a young man. So, for instance, um, when I was a little kid, if some tattooed up badass would have booted in the front door and beat the brakes off the guy that was molesting me or beating me with a two by four, right. man, I would have given a little cheer and had faith in God or the universe or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but that never happened. So the right. fact that I was able to do that for a couple of other little kids, man, worth it. Super worth it. That doesn't necessarily call for any accolades or anything like that. It's just, man, what a super honor. That was badass. Jason Vukovich was born in Anchorage, Alaska, June 25th of 1975, to a single mother. Her name is Sandra, but I call her Sandy. And I'll just let you all know right now, I'm just not a fan. The reason why is because she allowed this abuse that happened with Jason to happen. She totally threw her own son under the bus, and that's just not what you do with your own children. According to his sister, Angelina Lozano, who you guys will hear from later, Jason's father abandoned him when he was very young. Jason Vukovic was then adopted by the Fulton family. Larry Lee Fulton was his adoptive father. According to a letter that Jason Vukovic had written to the Anchorage Daily News, quote, Both of my parents were dedicated Christians and had us in every church service available two or three times each week, 
So you can imagine the horror and confusion I experienced when this man who adopted me began using late, late night prayer sessions to molest me. Fulton also used physical violence against Jason. He used anything from belts, two by fours, pretty much anything that Fulton could get his hands on at that point. During Vukovic's trial, Joel Fulton would say, quote, we'd roll over on our bunk beds and be up against the wall. It was my job to go first so he would leave Jason alone. I've listened to a few podcasts that have covered Jason's story, and he describes feeling like he had been put on the back burner pretty much his entire life. Understandably, Jason had a pretty jaded view on Christianity based off of what he had gone through growing up. I'm here to tell you all, you can't be a Christian in public and then beat and rape kids in private. Being Christian doesn't give you a free ticket to live a double life and also a free ticket to heaven. And I am saying that as a Christian. In 1989, Fulton was charged with second degree abuse of a minor, but did not do any prison time. He did three years of probation. That's it. Jason continues to add in interviews that nobody cared to check on him or his brother afterward. The abuse continued well into Vukovic's teens. And then when he was 16, he ran away to Washington. He and his girlfriend at the time, having nearly zero to their name, moved together to an apartment in Washington. He tried to return just to get his birth certificate and other forms of identification from his mother, and she just flat out refused. She basically chose her abusive husband over Jason and his brother. She would basically swat at them like flies and tell them to get out of her hair. He had then told Sandy that he was willing to leave and never return to get out of her hair, if you will. If only he could just retrieve those documents so that he could go out and get a job. So she refused. She threw his shit in the street, minus his ID and his other documentation. You will see that Jason has this disposition of life, that basically he's fair. But those that he had tried to make deals with throughout his life would basically just laugh in his face. Jason's story is very sad and unfortunate. And there are a lot of people out there that do not take too kindly to quote unquote vigilante justice. But what I'm trying to do here is tell you all the story of Jason Vukovic and how he came about and how this had all happened. And with that, I invite you all to think about this. Imagine being an abused kid who runs away. You have zero financial resources or identification. You're already troubled, so you have to do what you can to survive. That's Jason at 16. So he had turned to stealing to survive. I mean, he and his girlfriend were starving. He had a few odd jobs and such. One of them he had started working for as a telemarketer, had worked there for I believe two weeks, only for them to tell him that they couldn't pay him because he had no identification. And I mean, that's not fair. That's not fair at all. I get that they had legal obligations to uphold and that they had to do what they had to do. But still, from my perspective, they knowingly employed him without ID and then they can't pay him for the work that he had already did. That's just wrong. So at this point, he basically said, fuck it and quit. I mean, what are you going to do in that situation? Work for free? No, you're not. It was around this time where he got a gym membership somewhere and they had offered him a deal where it was like free for a day. He took that deal and then had access to the gym lockers somehow. And he came across a wallet with around $800. Now I know that hindsight is 2020 in this situation, but if you were to look at the circumstances he was in, he had no help. He had no hope. It was a sad situation all around and he was in survival mode. Imagine being 16 and you'd endured all of this. Had it been me, I would be afraid to tell someone that I had run away and tell them what had happened to me because speaking from experience and from stories friends have told me and from stories I've just read and even watched on TV, basically never trust an adult whether they promise not to break confidentiality or not. So. Jason and his girlfriend had come across this $800 from what I had heard from other podcasts and other news stories and the like. They had basically went ahead and furnished their apartment, purchased groceries, things like that. They were living in pure survival mode. Jason continued on his theft streak and he eventually did get caught. He served a good amount of time in jail after this. He then finally got out and he was maybe out for two or three days. There are news articles, some podcasts, anything in media that have reported this incorrectly. So I'm going to go ahead and give some facts that came straight from Angelina, his sister. Jason did use the Alaska sex offender registry to get the addresses for the sex offenders that he did assault. He did not, however, 
kill anybody, which was and even still is something of a common misconception to this day. And I have seen several comments here and there still basically cheering him on for killing people when he actually hadn't. It's important to know this because if people continue to spread misinformation, this can hurt somebody's case. He did not originally find the men's names from that registry. He actually got the men's names from an underground gangster community that aren't known to snitch on each other. So it was originally a list of eight people and then eventually nine known pedophiles who were known at the time to be actively offending and actively molesting these children. Once he obtained the list from these quote unquote grapevine sources, then he went to look them up on the computer and he found most of them were already registered sex offenders. So to clarify, he did not go look up random people on the sex offender registry. The names were given to him. Once he got the addresses, he went and set out to hunt. He did try to pick them off one by one. He then broke into their homes. He beat the living shit out of them. And then he stole from them. We get it. Stealing isn't the best idea. But come on, worse things have happened to far better people, right? Like, for example, Several children have had their lives and livelihood and innocence stolen from them, their happiness, their childhoods, all of that stolen from them because some pedophile wants to get his jollies. But okay, let's get mad about a fucking laptop. It's been confirmed that the items he stole from all of these men, he ended up not keeping for himself. He actually donated them instead to single mothers and abuse victims. He had said, that he did not wish to have anything from these pedophiles in his possession. He just wanted the justice for what they had done to children. These sex offenders were placed on the registry, according to Alaska's news source, quote, for crimes ranging from possession of child pornography to attempted sexual abuse of a minor. First of all, one might argue that if someone had possession of child pornography, that they would not be the one causing trauma directly to these children. But from what I've learned is that if you're knowingly viewing child pornography and receiving gratification from that, then you are absolutely a willing participant and therefore you are virtually sexually assaulting children. One of the offenders was convicted for child pornography. Jason, along with two females, busted the door down to the house. One of the women expressed a bit of shock, stating that it was like it was out of a movie, that the offender claimed that he hadn't done it in years, and that he was good and rehabilitated from pedophilia. Yeah. Okay. She also said that she and the other girl went rummaging through his house to steal some stuff. Um, he had a bunch of hangers with plaid shirts, and when she went to move them to the side, there was a wall covered in child pornography. She stated it was very disturbing, like living in a disturbing scene of some movie. What always comes to mind when I keep reading this is Lovely Bones. If you haven't read that book or watched that movie, I strongly recommend it, but trigger warnings abound. So somehow Jason Vukovic was apprehended after the third assault and then pled guilty to the assaults in 2016, but on one condition, that his sentence be no longer than the combined sentences of his father and the three assholes he rightfully assaulted. Around the time Jason was arrested and starting to serve time in prison, his sister Angelina Lozano comes into the picture. Right here is her story as to how they had connected. Another thing that I've recently, you know, started learning about is like, you know, because I'm sure you and I were raised that we respect our elder. Uh, We hug old uncle so-and-so or distant cousin so-and-so and, and, you know, all that kind of weird shit. And, you know, I don't think we should force our kids to be doing that. No, if they don't feel comfortable doing it, like, absolutely. You don't have to freaking kiss or hug or hang out or talk to any of these people. I don't care if we're related to them. I, I'm sorry, kids. You, yes, yes, you do somewhat have to respect your elders to a certain point. But if you right. don't feel comfortable doing something, tell them no and talk to your parents, you know, talk to your absolutely. parents about it. Right. So his last name is actually his ex-wife's last name. She oh. is Serbian. Um, that he adopted that last name because he did not want any of his three parents' last names, right? Like, uh, none of his his biological father, our biological father, his biological mother, or his stepdad did not want any part of that. So that's where that last name came from. Quick backstory, our father married their mother, had Joel, and then a few years later had Jason. Shortly thereafter, he had an affair with a woman named Marietta. Our father's name is Gary Lanthier. 
Um, uh, Marietta, I don't know what her maiden name is. It's now Lamphere. She's there, actually still married to this day. He had an affair um, and, on Sandy um, and then basically left them and never turned back when Jason was three. Right. About seven years later, before Marietta and Gary got married, um, they were in Castle, Wyoming. Gary was working at the Hilton where he met my mother. They had another, uh, they had a, an affair. When he found out she was pregnant, he said, peace out. You know, I have, you know, an ex-wife and a current wife and two kids. I'm out of here. I don't want any part of it. Right. So, growing up, so Jason and Joel never knew about me. Sandy never knew about me. Um, growing up, I knew about them because my family knew who he was and knew he had an ex-wife with two kids. Knew all of that. Right. So, um, so I, for, uh, you know, whenever I got to a certain age and the internet became a thing, uh, for about 16 years off and on, I would look for my brothers, you know, I would, I would get on the internet and I would try to find my dad and my brother and I could always find Lip Gary, I could always find Gary, but I could never find my brothers. Um, and I, I didn't know it was because Sandy was the mother and Marietta was not. Anyways, so in about, in 2017, November of 2017, an ad came across my Facebook for um, a 30, uh, free 30-day trial of Ancestry.com. So I was like, you know what? I bet you I can find my brothers in 30 days. You know, and just cancel that. I don't need it. You know, whatever. I just need to find them, right? Um, well, I found them within three days. Um, I was in contact with Sandy. I was in with their other half-brother. Uh, and I found Jason in prison. Now, the other half-brother, his name is Jason Fulton. I mean, just Fulton. Sorry, all the J's get me mixed up. Um, yeah, Justin Fulton had reached out to Joel for me and said, hey, you have a long-lost sister, half-sister. Half She's, you know, what, what, can I give her your information? She'd love to contact you. And he said, no, thank you. So, um, and then he broke the news about Jason. And then I did the research online. I found him. Mm -hmm. And I did not write to him or reach out to him right away. There was a few reasons. Um, the first and main reason was a selfish reason, was because his story was all over the news. And I did not want to get dusted under the rug or to the side or brushed in with like, oh, these are just fan girls, blah, 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 or whatever. Right. You know, me trying to claim him as my family, that kind of thing. And then the second reason was I really didn't want to distract him while he's waiting. He was waiting on sentencing, um, you know, uh, the, the sentencing hearing. And I didn't, um, yeah, I didn't want to distract him from that. So those are two reasons. Well, I had saved this, I had bookmarked this, um, page where I could go on and check what was going on with his case and I would check on it and it just kept getting postponed, 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 sentencing get, just kept getting postponed. Um, and so I um, I actually had to, uh, my, my one of our cousins had reached out to me. I had gotten in, in touch with the, the Lampier family and one of the cousins had reached out to me in like April of 2018. And she was like, hey, do you have Jason's address and information to where I can write him a letter? And I said, I don't have it on hand, but let me Google it for you. I'm on the phone there, and I start Googling, and the first thing that pops up is um, Jason Vukovic sentenced to 23 years um, or 25 years or whatever it said. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, that's how I found out what he was sentenced. He was sentenced in February in 2018, and I broke down. Like, I just cried. I was heartbroken. I, obviously, I was obviously heartbroken. Um, during the, you know, when I, whenever I found him, and though all of those months I spent researching him, right? Um, all of those months I spent researching stories and and everything that I could find, and I pieced together his entire story, and I was just completely crushed. So, yeah. So April is when I wrote him my first letter. It was nine pages long, telling how I found him, who I was, you know. All of this, and I basically wrapped it up with, listen, I can't, I don't understand how none of our family is here and supports you or, you know, any of how they all turn their back on you. I just flabbergasted, you know, me, I grew up without parents. My mom died when I was six. I never met our dad. Um, and then I had my own kids. And just to have parents that could do that to their own child was, for me, it was, was like, it was heartbreaking and like unimaginable like how could you do this so um so i reached out to him and i was like you know i'm your sister and i know nobody's in your corner right now or has never been in your corner i will you know 
I'm here if you'll have me kind of thing. And it, and it was funny because, you know, it takes like seven to ten days for them to get the mail. Oh, and I sent a stack of pictures, hundreds of pictures right. um, and of me growing up from the, uh, you know, born all the way to current and, his, you know, his nieces, my, my two daughters. Yeah. And so, you know, it takes seven to ten days. So I kind of, you know, had not forgotten about it, but it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. Right. And one night, my husband and I were sitting there on the couch. I get this 888 number, 800 or some weird number calling me. And I decline it or whatever. And then they call me again and call me again. And eventually, I think I actually declined the call. And I said, fuck you. Or I said something like with a, like, just like a, God, this person, won't, this, this company won't stop calling me, you know? And so my husband like goes, geez, Angelina, calm down. What if it's your brother? And it never even occurred to me that it could be my brother. And I was like, yeah. And I kind of looked at him and I was just kind of like, whatever, it's not my brother. And I pick up the phone and I call the number back and yeah. it's Securus, which is the company, it's, it's the Securus Technologies, which is the phone company that the prison uses for the inmates to be able to call. And then, yeah. So, of course, I freak out, and I start crying, and I throw the phone across the room. I'm like, oh, my brother. Oh. I set him a account, and he called me the next day, and I'll never forget. I was drinking in the Globe Ultra, and he called me the next day, and I'm, like, so nervous, and I answer it, and I'm like, hello? And he goes, you better answer the phone when your brother calls you. Those he, he ever said to me were those words. And I just started laughing, and we have basically been best friends ever since. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It's funny because growing up, I thought I had the shitty end of the stick because yeah. I thought that my dad stayed with their mother and raised those two boys. And I wasn't jealous. I wasn't mad. All I wanted was to look at my own dad's face. I wanted to look at my own two brothers' faces and meet them so they could see me and I could see them. And that's yeah. all I wanted. I didn't care. And I thought I had the shitty end of the stick. And then I found out what happened to them and I was like dude I had it I had it great like my I didn't have parents but you know I was raised by my family they kept me they loved me they supported me they still yeah. do you know like I was the lucky one I didn't know yeah. so Ugh. when I first found out obviously it was rough but I was also ecstatic that I'm in touch with him now and I can be in his corner you know what I'm saying like yeah at the very least and I had no idea any of this whole campaign and, you know, his story kind of blowing up was even going to happen because it had happened years ago when it first, you know, went, went down. Everything was on the news and, and stuff. And then right. it just fizzled out, right? So that that was never the intention. That was never planned. We had no idea. Um, mm -hmm. And so I loved it. It was, it was you know, it's just having to, a loved one uh, locked up and having to support them and I've never had this, this is my first experience with it, is not only um, emotionally a struggle, but financially, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah. and especially if you're their only support, you know, you not. there's not a bunch of other family, we don't have cousins and brothers and aunts and uncles calling him and sending him money and going to visit him, it's me, you know what I'm right. saying? Like, there's not, there's there's nobody else, and, 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 you know, I obviously, I have a career, I have a house and a property, and I have two kids, and I have two dogs, and I have a husband, and then... Right. And now I have Jason, right? And it's not yeah. just like having a normal brother out and just living their life and working and whatever. It's, you know, I have to support him. And I'm happy to do it. I love it. In fact, it helps me as well. Like I, you know, and, and but it just, it definitely, it is stressful. It's very stressful. Yeah. It can get expensive. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's almost, and, and now, so his after basically what happened was his story started to go viral again because there was some big page I think on Facebook that posted about him people were like oh we know his sister you know and they were yeah. tagging me in it and being like and how do we and so I called I was like I don't know how to answer these people's questions and they're asking <laughs> how to donate to his commissary and how do we help him so I asked Jason I was like what do you want to do because donating to his commissary is kind of a real pain in the butt which I can go into later but I was yeah. like, what do you want me to tell these people? And he was like, he was like, well, why don't you just start like a GoFundMe or a something? Because I'm going to need, you know, if we can raise an attorney to help me prepare for parole, the parole board, that, yeah. you know, that could help me actually have a chance at getting parole. And I was like, okay, so that's what we did. And then his story just started, it just started blowing up out of nowhere. And so trying to manage all the social media and all of that kind of stuff, um, uh, when it first happened, because, and I totally, totally fucked up and went live with him on Facebook, 
um, on speakerphone, and I didn't know we couldn't do that, and I ended up getting my phone blocked. I, I went live two nights in a row, and I got my phone number blocked, and I ended up having to get a new phone. It's a new oh phone number. God. Yeah, because <clears throat> apparently it's literally written in the fine print. You can't do that, because apparently some inmates were doing that, and they were calling their victims out, which are not allowed to do that, and threatening right. people and shit like that. So, anyways... So when I did that, when we did the live, like that blew up. And I'm telling you, when I say I had thousands of messages in my inbox trying to read and respond to these people, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a full time job. It's like my second job. <laughs> so, oh, I, I even at one point I had my kids helping. I'm like, here, I'm gonna log you in. Here's all the generic template, you know, thank you messages <laughs> that you got to respond to people. Wow. Here's the link to whatever, you know, and I had them helping too. And it was, it got crazy there for a while. It has, you know, fizzled out, not fizzled out, it's, it's slowed down a little bit. So it's not like crazy, crazy. Um, but like I said, it is, it is definitely a full-time job. And a lot of people, you know, if people question why I'm trying to get his story out there, there's a handful of reasons. A, we were able to raise enough money to hire an attorney. Okay. Right. Um, B, I think that this topic, um, and this is in no particular order of importance, by the way, um, right. B, uh, um, just this topic alone needs to be talked about more. It does. Um, Absolutely. More, 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 like so much more. And I had mm-hmm. honestly no clue how bad of a problem this was until his stuff blew up and I started getting all these messages from people telling me their stories, men, women, about you know, being molested as children or just raped in general, just right. it was flabbergasting. I, I could not believe. So that that is a huge reason. And obviously, you know, have you heard of Sinclair Brown? They did a freaking documentary on on her. And when yeah. the documentary aired, these lawyers, these attorneys, came to her side pro bono, I might add, and ended up getting her out of prison. I will say this on record. Many times, you'll never hear me say anything different. I'm ne- I will never say what he did was right. And I'm not, I'll never, I'm not gonna say ever that he doesn't deserve prison time or jail time for what, for what he did. He did commit crimes. It was, it was right. you know, it is what it is. But man, right. just writing him a letter, you know, and he writes everybody back. So don't think that you're, you're gonna write him a letter and he, you're not gonna hear anything back. It doesn't matter what country you're in. No, you know, anything. doesn't matter. He will write back, and he's I mean, actually he's a really good writer. I mean, you can directly put money on his book, but it is, there's a whole runaround that you have to do. You have to download a visitor form app. You have to fill it out. You have to mail it in. You have to pass a background check. Um, and then once the prison and Jason approve you as a, vi- as a visitor, then you can mail in money orders or checks. They don't have JPAY. They don't, you can't get online and donate, right. which is why... And also, he's only allowed to have 10 approved visitors on his list at the, at one time. So just writing him keeps his spirits up, like knowing that there's a whole army out here that support him. That's huge, huge. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a petition out there, a change.org petition out there that's got, uh, I don't even know how many. I haven't checked it in a couple of weeks, but there's one in that, there's one in the link. Are in my in the link tree, so that's the one that the main one that we're using. So they've taken down a couple of them, yeah. Um, and I believe it's because um, it supports somebody who committed a violent crime, um, right. and that goes against their policy. But we're uh-huh. just not going to bring it up to them. And they right. took down two, and it's because I contacted them to get them merged together, and they did research into it and found it. So just having that's- those signatures, even if it gets taken down later. It yeah. just it helps to show the judge, helps to show, you know, those kinds of things. So sign, sign, sign. It's easy. Sign and share. Right. Do not donate to them, though, because all that money will get lost. So do, right. not, do not donate to change.org. Oh, about the letter, which I put on everything, but it's, everything's going to get photocopied black and white. Okay. Um, don't put, you know, nothing with perfume or lipstick or uh, food splatters. You know, if you send a card, they're just going to photocopy it. He's not going to see the colors or anything. Yeah. So... So to keep it simple, silly. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, absolutely. Welcome to the True Crime Podcast by Indie Drop In. Each week features an entire episode of the best independent podcasters. Content will range from cold cases, white collar conspiracies to downright creepy events. Best of all, if you like the creator, you can easily follow them for more great content. Hit subscribe and check out IndieDropIn.com to learn more.
Welcome to an undisclosed location. We are Murder Incorporated. Give me one good reason why people should listen to our podcast, buddy. Because you're getting true crime from a nerd and a murderer's son all wrapped into one. Yes, my father is a murderer, and you are indeed a nerd, buddy. What else sets us apart, Harley? I truly believe our empathy for the victims and their families shines through every episode. Also, 100% of all our listeners have not been murdered. We We are are Murder Murder Incorporated. Incorporated. Hey there, friend. My name's Sarai, and I host a spooky, casual podcast called Freaky AF, where I tell you stories of conspiracies, true crime, and of the supernatural. So if that's your kind of shiz, come check us out. I'm sure we'll be great friends. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, and a bunch of other places. Or you can look us up on Twitter and Instagram, where Freaky AF Pod, that's F-R-E-A-K-Y-A-F-P-O-D. Come get spooked, y'all. So who are these supposed victims? First, there's Charles Albee. He was slapped and punched a few times and then robbed. The second is Andres Barbosa. Again, slapped and punched a few times and then robbed. I believe this is the guy that I mentioned above with the child pornography. And the third one, and there was only three, Wesley Demarest. (laughs) I hate this guy. I, I don't like any of them, but I seriously hate this guy. Anyway, he tried to fight back. So Vukovic came in like an avenging angel and beat him with a hammer. Um, Demarest now has lasting brain injuries, but, you know, there's also lasting trauma to the children Demarest had abused. Despite this lasting brain trauma, Demarest remembers clear as day Vukovic coming into his home at around 1 a.m. His roommate, another male, and his... And this detail has been debated, but some say it was actually a bed and breakfast he ran and that these were tenants, but no matter. Whoever it was that was there had alerted Demaris, but was pushed to the side. Vukovic, wielding a hammer, then said, Are you Wesley Demaris, and are you on the sex offender registry? Demarist says, Yes. Vukovic says, Do you believe you've paid for your crimes? Demarist says, Yes. And Vukovic goes, No, you did not pay for it enough. Demarest laments that he didn't feel like he deserved it. Quote, but I guess I do. I guess my punishment isn't over yet. Pretty much a guilt trip. Demarest was convicted earlier of attempted sexual abuse against a kindergartner, a five-year-old. He served nine whole months in jail and then served three whole years as a sex offender in the sex offender treatment program. Demarest says all he has done for the past 11 or so years is think about his crime and how he regrets it. And right here, I will tell you, I have zero sympathy because A, you did it once, you will reoffend. B, I think this is a ploy to try to manipulate people into feeling sorry for him. And C, what about the kindergartner he attempted to sexually assault? I mean, what has she been thinking about all these years? He also complains that this attack that Vukovic had carried out has cost him his job and destroyed his life. Boo fucking who? Demarest says he prefers that, quote, the man who fractured my skull was not walking around while I'm alive. But I'm sure that those children prefer that the man who basically stole their childhood was not walking around while they were alive. So there's that. He says about the attack that Jason laid on him, quote, mentally, I'm still baffled. And you know what? That's the one thing you and I can agree on, Demarest, because I'm still mentally baffled how you can think you're a victim. Demarest sustained injuries including a fractured skull, a swollen eye, limited speech, and some brain damage. Children offended by him, however, have sustained mental, physical, emotional trauma, PTSD, a lifetime of therapy, trust issues, probable nightmares, emotional disturbances well into adulthood, being prone to addictions, and many other things, but sorry about your your head, you fucking potato. So I had spoken with Angelina, and there were some things that she had said to me that I want to help clear the air about. So as of October of 2020, Vukovic had appealed his case stating that PTSD was a factor that provoked him to attack three well-deserving sex offenders. And by the way, he isn't the one calling them well-deserving sex offenders. I just want to make that clear. That's me, Courtney Fenner, on a Nefarious Nightmare podcast. Unfortunately, he did lose that appeal, but he and his sister, as well as supporters, are working to get him paroled by 2023, which is next year, as of the time of recording this. 
He entered into a plea deal with the state and pled guilty to one count of attempted assault, one count of robbery. According to Cheyenne Matthews of Alaska's news source, Vukovic was sentenced to 28 years in prison with five years suspended and five years on probation in 2018. Now, according to New York Post, his attorney, Ember Tilton, agreed that he needed some sort of rehabilitation, quote, for a very long time due to the extent of abuse he had endured, but also said, quote, I don't think he needs to be punished. Tilton told the paper, quote, he's already been punished. The whole thing started out as a punishment of a child who didn't deserve to be treated in that way. Similarly, his brother, Joel Fulton, who had ran away after enduring the same abuse, maintains to this day that he still has not recovered. He's still not okay. And I mean, sexual abuse is traumatizing. Fortunately for Joel, though, he has been able to graduate college, he started his own family, and is very successful in his line of business. And he also is known to keep to himself. Jason Vukovic appealed his sentence, mentioning that PTSD was a contributing factor, and that when he committed any crimes that he was under duress that his sentence should be no longer than the combined prison terms of his three quote-unquote victims, plus the sentence given to, to the man who Vukovic had said molested him as a child. Let's just remember here that all of these men are walking freely. His stepdad has passed away, so in my opinion, he did get away with it, unfortunately. He had made the court aware of his childhood sexual abuse, but they failed to consider that and basically swept him under the rug like everybody else has all his life. They also said that Vukovic failed to present evidence of being under duress, even though he was officially diagnosed with PTSD five years prior. And a doctor testified in his favor stating, quote, his behaviors were consistent with someone who suffers from PTSD. He also agreed that his sentence was excessive and that nobody had any mind to rehabilitate, just punish. The court basically said, sorry about your luck, buddy. We don't do vigilante justice around here. Well, Judge Aaron Marston, would you throw him in lock if he had avenged your child? To quote from Angelina's text from back when we first recorded this episode, she says, So we appealed the sentence and requested a sentence reduction based on the fact that he was diagnosed with, with PTSD and they did not consider this diagnosis when they sentenced him. The state and the Supreme Court denied the appeal request, taking the side of the prosecution, as they argued that they did not present enough evidence of the PTSD diagnosis. We have applied and been approved for a post-conviction relief hearing, which basically means that we're going to go and state that his representation at the time of the sentencing did not do the bare minimum to show the evidence of the PTSD diagnosis. We can continue to go back on that one, but we are just in a waiting game for dates and paperwork. He does have a discretionary parole hearing in July of 2023 that we are preparing for, including trying to get him PTSD treatment, a paralegal degree, support letters from the outside world and stating they will support him when he gets out, and having him take all the classes and getting all the sets of his certifications he possibly can while inside. He will need a job, a place to live, support, and some money to get him on his feet when he gets out. And if we had all of that set up for him before he goes to the parole board, that that will show that we've worked really hard. Here's a brief excerpt from Angelina Lozano from her TikTok page explaining the good news that we will be discussing. That's not what I'm here to tell you today. I'm actually here to give you good news about his case. Um, an amazing update that honestly has I think it's going to change our lives. Um, Jason has been accepted into what's called the TLC program. It's an 18 month spiritually centered um, uh, rehabilitation and treatment program um, that has very high success rates and extremely low recidivism rates, which is huge. That's huge. Um, that combined with the PTSD therapy that we're getting him and we've also just found out that they accepted his request to have a drug um, assessment evaluation which basically he does have drug charges and so um, they can hold that against him in parole hearing if he doesn't get treatment for it so if he gets an assessment they will allow him to get treatment so all of those things on top of he's writing books right now he's already written one book and it is fire by the way 
uh, it um, gives him a huge chance. And if I might, if I can let you guys into a little piece of me that I don't tell people very often, um, I just found my brother in 2018, and ever since I found him, my heart and soul has had a negative energy or aura or feeling or vibe, whatever you want to call it, around his parole hearing or his parole in general. Um, you know, when you have that feeling that you know this is going to happen or this isn't going to happen, like I had that negative feeling and I never told anybody about it. And that changed today. Like the, the switch has now flipped and it's like, I know now and I have positive energy around it. And I honestly have been holding back tears all day. Um, and in our pilot I episode, think- you heard me interview Jason Vukovic. Here's Jason now with how he's been doing and what's been going on. Therapy's a trip. I'll say that right now. Uh, I think I think what needs to be said about therapy is number one, I was always too alpha male. I'm good. I'm good to even consider it. And it's not like therapy was offered to me a number of times and I turned it down. But just in general, I think I held in my mind, I'm good. Um, and it turns out therapy is a very positive thing. Um, and it seems to me, it appears to be less about the magic things that they have to say. And it appears to be more about you hearing yourself talk uh, um, and learning from the words that are coming out of your own mouth. Um, so therapy has been a really positive and good thing for me. And also what's been surprising is there's a number of subject matters that I was not expecting to receive support on. Um, And this particular therapist has supported me on a number of my positions, um, which was surprising to me. I wasn't expecting that. I'm so used to being kicked in the face or people telling me I'm wrong or bad for thinking how I think or feel. But I was very surprised. Uh, And that's not to say all of my positions are correct, but I was just super surprised. She supported a number of the things that I thought or felt Um, especially as pertains to pedophiles and things like that. So that was cool. I mean, that was super cool. So I I know I was dismissive of it and honestly didn't want to do it. Like, I mean, I was extremely grateful for the opportunity and the fact that a stranger was willing to pay $1,000 a month or however much it is. It's a lot um, for me to have four sessions per month and go. And I was extremely grateful and blessed. But as far as actually... You know, sitting there and doing it. I remember uh, my girl asking me, like, oh, are you excited? I'm like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. No, I'm not. Um, but now, having gone through the process, uh, as far as we were able to go, man, it's great. It's great. I should have done this when I was 22. I probably would have had a much different life. I mean, pretty much the biggest change in my life is I'm now, I have this bad love relationship with this beautiful little. Uh, woman in Texas so that's been a major change for me I haven't had anything like that in my life for over a decade for a long time <clears throat> so strangely while it makes things much better and it gives you something to look forward to every day and stuff like that it also makes things much harder because I live in captivity you know so now uh, you really want to fucking get out <laughs> you know what I mean you're like damn it so as much as it's wonderful, it's also terrible at the same time in that way. You know what I mean? So, but it has given me something to look forward to. She's extremely loyal and faithful and a patient person, which is great because I'm something of a ruffian. At least that's what I've become, it seems like. And, uh, you know, she handles it uh, with grace, which is wonderful. And, uh... You know, it's been great. She's been able to come up here and see me twice. One time she flew all the way up here from Texas to sit at a hotel seven blocks away because the prison was shut down for a COVID protocol and we had to look at each other on Skype for 45 minutes. That's what she got for a 
10,000 mile round trip, which was horrible. So fun. I know. I was like, oh my God, she's literally six blocks away and I cannot see her in person. It was insane. And so the second, the second visit was tight because we got to see each other in person, but it's what they call secure visits, which means there's glass in between us. Mm. But that was also hilarious because we sort of pawed at the glass like lovesick teenagers for three straight days. <laughs> and kind of sort of got ourselves in trouble too at the same time. Use your imagination. But that was hilarious. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so that was really great. That was really cool. I haven't seen anything that beautiful in person in a long time. So it's awesome. Yeah, she's hella awesome. She really is. And I'm telling you, it's just it's just what the universe had in store for me. Um, and. It's like she's had a number of difficulties that she's had to survive and surmount in her life. Um, and the fact that she has turned out with the character that she has is what makes her incredible. That's what it is. So I think most people would have been bitter as hell uh, yeah. having to deal with what she's had to deal with, and she's not, and it's amazing. So. That's just, I really respect that about her a lot. I'm dying to talk about. I don't know. Not really. I feel like this is my Tom Cruise, Oprah Winfrey moment where I should jump up and down on the couch and say, oh, yeah, I'm in love. <laughs> the things that are positive along the way is I was extremely grateful and blessed that this, I think it was now yeah, media, but this guy with this podcast, man, they were kind enough to pay for this PTSD therapy for four months. Yeah. Uh, and I'm talking to the tune of $1,200 per month. It was like 5000 bucks. That was really expensive and really kind and really exceptionally amazing for someone to do on my behalf. All I can tell you is that uh, in this life, people love the awards and the ribbons, and, but they hate the labor. Like they're mm -hmm. there for the, for the fireworks and for the talk, but yeah. when it comes to putting the, the meat on the table, they disappear, and this guy... Him and his partner, let me tell you what, not only did they find the therapist, they found her. Yeah. I didn't even find her. They found her. Uh, and paid for it for four months. Um, and that's pretty amazing. And I was pretty humbled and pretty grateful. So um, that's a very rare and strange and mysterious thing to have happen in this life. So that was way cool. Um, yeah. I also applied for, and it appears as though I was accepted to this 18-month program that they have at a different prison, a lower security prison than this one. And I was supposed to have been transferred to it at some point uh, around the first of the year, but that did not happen because they got damage to the buildings out there or something. So that's been delayed. But uh, this is one of those programs that has like a 90% parole rate. If you graduate it, you're basically, you're getting paroled. That's a cool thing, when and if it actually occurs and they actually get me over there. I'm, I'm grateful to have made it into a slot over there. Um, that's pretty cool, because the way these prisons are run up here nowadays, there are very, very, very few avenues to get yourself out the gate. Um, for the most part, they want to warehouse you and leave you on that shelf for as long as possible. Yeah, they just mysteriously went off for about five days, which was strange. Um, I don't know what happened. They tell us very, very little, but then equally as mysteriously, they just turn back on on their own. <laughs> so I don't know what the problem was, but it's kind of, I mean, it's been a really rough time around here as far as that goes. Like there's just some days where, you know, it's the time of day in the morning where the doors open so you can move around and live your life. Yeah. And they've either had us restricted to this room uh, you can come out of your cell, but you cannot leave this room and go anywhere else. Or they've had us just locked in our cells entirely due to short staff. So it's been rough. So trust me, COVID and its effects have made it all the way up here, even to these prisons. It's just made time much, much more difficult. Just don't forget about your boy here in prison. Send me a letter. Always write back. And, uh, you know, just... Embrace your own little families that you're around. It's a big deal. I haven't had one for a long time, and I live by myself, and it sucks. So someday I'll get to come out and see all y'all. That'd be nice. Initially, what I was hoping to accomplish was 
about a few of these pieces of shit off so they don't fuck with kids tomorrow. So that yeah. needs to be affected in the short term. Um, but honestly, in the long term, um, I'm hoping to find myself in the position where, you know, whether it's associated with a nonprofit or something that I'm able to do through the writing, just where I'm able to you have one minute left. uplift other people that have a similar background or upbringing to mine. So, right. ultimately, that's really what I'm Now, about. here is his girlfriend, Allie Blanchard, who was mentioned in the recording. Uh, my name's Allie, and I am from Houston, Texas. I learned of Jason from the, like, the viral meme that everybody sees, I'm sure, is like, this is the Alaskan Avenger, the one where he's with his brother in the picture. At first, I contacted Angelina, his sister, and said, like, hey, I'm just trying to, like, support y'all. Can I write Jason? She's like, yeah, this is info, even though there's already, like, stuff that said that. It's kind of one of, like, a confirmation. I don't know. So she sent me the address again, and I wrote a basic-ass little letter that was like, hi, this is my name. You're, you as a person interest me. Like, that's about it. It's very, very short. And um, then at the end, I wrote my number and, like, called over and over, and I didn't know who was calling. And then finally, I had to get Angelina to text me and be like, Jason, I'm trying to call you. Oh, because I don't answer numbers. I don't know, like, what you're talking about. <laughs> so, we've been, like, talking on the phone for, like, a month. This little, this dude, he, like, literally called me and asked me, will you make me the most happiest? man in the world if you'd be my girlfriend <laughs> like like um it's cute but yeah that's what he said after a month of talking on the phone um i've been to alaska twice now um the first time i only got to see him through like video because of co- coronavirus and then the second time i got to see him like through the glass like um three days but visitation was twice a day so so jason is currently uh, moving to the tlc program whenever they decide to move him i don't know when that is that program that is hopefully going to get him his parole his parole date is on um july of 2023 we don't know the exact date. i don't know the exact date but it's in that time range uh, that month and hoping that this spiritual based program that he's going to like the um i think like the rate of people receiving parole because of this program is like 90% or something like that that I've heard um, from Jason of course and um, so that is really exciting um, we're really hoping that this is what he needs to get his parole he's just you know staying out of trouble and um, also he's doing his PTSD therapy but it's about to come to an end unfortunately um, True Crime can't really help out with paying for the therapist up until about going to be in a couple weeks, I think, that it's going to end. Um, Jason just says if anybody wants to be supportive and help out with the PTSD therapy, either donations or getting another one, that would be great. Um, what else? And he also said that he really like, needs music credits. He like loves music and um, there's a way to do that. It's all on the link tree on his page or Angelina's, you know, my, I think it's in my bio too, but and less important. Okay, he is like a genius. I've never met anybody smarter. Um, like, I'm sure anybody that has talked to him or spoken to him, being like, I can't even get the right words out. Anyone that has spoken to him, I'm sure can say the same thing. Like, he constantly blows me away with how intelligent he is. Um, very kind hearted, like, like a little teddy bear inside this, like, heart shell, basically. That's how I would describe it. He's very sweet, very kind, not a violent person at all. Um, You know, he had to really force himself to do those those acts, and that was all to protect children. Unfortunately, it seems as though there are a lot of systems in place where the sex offenders, pedophiles, etc. are coddled to, and they get away with a smack on the wrist. And then there's those who do little to nothing crime-wise, and they're being absolutely punished. And then there's people saying, according to Jason Vukovic himself, that they don't deal too kindly to vigilanteism when people do a job of law enforcement, things like that. But you know, you wouldn't have to worry about that if, I don't know, if y'all, let me go out on a limb here. This, this might be a big stretch. 
maybe believe kids who make accusations. I mean, what I've learned at a prior place of employment, I'm not going to mention the name, but it was an organization or law firm that was dealt primarily in keeping sex offenders and pedophiles separated from children in any child serving organization. But these people were certifiably professional. And one thing I learned was that children 99% of the time aren't lying when they make this kind of an accusation. I also learned that sex offenders are likely to reoffend. To end this, I am happy that Jason Vukovic has such a following and people he can lean on for support. But I am really fucking disappointed in our system. I do believe that the pedophiles got what they deserved, but I do not think that justice for Jason Vukovic has been served just yet. Now a recap on the updates. Currently, Jason is finishing up some treatment. Angelina recently expressed a shift in their hope for the positive, given that they were able to get some PTSD treatment for him as well as a class. The reason that the shift of hope is important for me to mention is because it takes you, the listener, to share his case everywhere. As for the treatment in classes, I would love to take credit for that one. I really would. But it was 1159 Media who donated that to him, which is extremely generous and absolutely needed. Jason and I have written two letters back and forth. I feel bad because I haven't had a chance to sit down and write him. I mean, life has really gotten in the way. COVID. Like, am I right? But he did say that he's very grateful for all of the support, care, and encouragement that he's been shown. He does feel the need to let everyone know that he does not advise others to go out and bust doors down to attack people, no matter how justified you or I may see it, for the reasons that he did. So... Also, his uh, favorite color is red. As of the latest letter, he really digs Yellow Wolf. Uh, He just wants a fucking chicken sandwich, guys. Um, He also enjoys reading and listening to music. So to those of you who truly want to reach out and help him with anything, books and music really help him to pass the time. He also does like to write back if you write him a letter. And he wants to know about all people. He's currently in a long-term relationship with Allie Blanchard, who I've mentioned and who was interviewed for this podcast. And she's become a good friend of mine in the past six months that we've been doing this podcast. To recap on all of the interviews that you've heard today, he did complete the manuscript titled Son of Solitude, and that has been submitted to the publisher. And that could possibly be in print within the next year. Um, As soon as I get some updated answers, I will definitely let you all know. He currently has another three sessions of PTSD, um, but then they're going to need more funding. So if anybody would like to donate to that, please do so. We, as always, will add that link tree to our show notes. Um, But he is looking for donations to help continue working on his trauma from the years of abuse. His discretionary parole date is still the same, July of 2023. I think that the best birthday gift to him, because July is his birthday, would be for him to be a free man. And he did say that his outlook has definitely changed. Uh, He finally has real love and hope in his life. And that has changed everything. And um, that whenever the phones don't work, that he's viciously depressed. He is in major need of music credits in his music player. And um, that's it, guys. So thank you guys for listening once again. I will add a full bonus clip just for our Patreons. That way you guys can hear... Um, all of the interviews in full. Um, And that's it. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Um, Find us anywhere that you can find podcasts. Uh, Hit up our website. Uh, Drop in on our Instagram or our Twitter and say hi. And I will let Jason Vukovic himself sign us off. Oh yeah, by the way, make sure uh, you gotta remember, tell everybody, don't be a fucking dick. Wear some deodorant. My goddamn. Yeah, it's mandatory. Well, Jason, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, All right, cool. You have, you have my number, and you know you can call me. Oh, right on. Well, maybe next time you don't write me for six months, I'll just ring you up to make you feel hey. good. Hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Courtney. I appreciate you very, very right, much. much. Much love. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Talk to you Bye. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. All research done for this podcast, depending on the episode, is written by Amanda Cronin and Courtney Fenner.
Scripting, editing, mastering, and sound design are done by Courtney Fenner. If you would like to visit our links, merch store, or social media, please either go to www.anefariousnightmare.com or to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash a nefarious nightmare podcast. Music used for our intro and exit is by Ghost Stories Incorporated. You may find their music at bandcamp.com. Additional backing music for today's episode was provided by Epidemic Sound. Please consider leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts to help us expand our audience. Thank you very much for listening and take care.